Up next is going to be uh, Julian, and uh, he's going to talk uh, and do a, a panel with uh, Beth Novak uh, Milliken. Uh, they're going to address uh, a couple of key initiatives with the International Wineries for Climate Action. So I'm super excited to find out how they're increasing uh, a community of wineries that are dedicated to protecting the earth. Um, this is a really cool, uh, really cool group, and um, they're doing some really excellent work. Uh, we're running a little bit uh, slow on time, so um, you know, I, 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 I get it if you guys have got to, got to go. But um, stay long enough to to see this panel, and um, we're really excited. So go ahead, go ahead, Julian. Sorry about the, the, the timing issue, um, but those kinds of things happen. No, no problem. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Lafour, for um, including us in this really, really interesting day of uh, discussion. Um, I think it's it's really appropriate that we kind of uh, are going towards the end um, <clears throat> of today's conversation. And I, I really think that, that this discussion is going to zoom out a little bit from the technical presentations that you've heard uh, into kind of greater business strategy and, and ultimately where we go from here now that we know what we know about climate change. And, um, and some of the adaptation um, activities that have been described earlier on. Um, I wanna go back a little bit to reference Dr. Jones's presentation from this morning in that you know, we're really only just now starting to see the impacts of climate change uh, on wine growing. And um, I, I'm of the opinion, I think it's shared by most of the, science, uh, the, the, the scientists who you've heard from today and the practitioners, that really the worst is yet to come uh, and that we within the grape and wine industry are particularly vulnerable. Um, Dr. Jones spoke a lot about adaptation, uh, which obviously is very critical as we all kind of adjust to this quote unquote new normal. Um, and where I wanna focus uh, my discussion today and uh, my Q&A with Beth, uh, who I'll be bringing on in a moment, is really more around mitigation and what we can do as an industry to um, stem the tide of climate change and the activities that we can do. Um, Josiah, I thought your presentation was incredibly relevant and um, it really kind of speaks to the heart of where uh, we all need to be moving in terms of adopting more regenerative uh, practices in our vineyards. Um, and I think biochar has a key role to play um, uh, really at a holistic level. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I am going to share my slideshow. Um, let's see, screen one, screen two. Let me know if you can all see that. Um, and just give me a, give me a shout when you guys can all see what. Um, uh, can you all see that? The, the no, image? it's uh, it's still um, just seeing your. Just my mug. Uh, let me try this again. Uh, there you go. Excellent. Yeah, go ahead and make okay. it. There you go. Is that showing uh, out of presenter mode? You can just see that that primary slide. Perfect. Yeah, you're okay. good. So we're going to touch on. Uh, I'm going to spend probably about uh, ten or minutes talking about uh, international wineries for climate action, providing some some high level details about the organization, and then I'll transition into a Q&A uh, with Beth Novak Milliken, who's the um, president and CEO of Spotswood Estate. And Spotswood recently signed on to joining uh, our activities at IWCA. Um, so at a high level, uh, before I introduce uh, IWCA, I want to talk a little bit about where we are going at Jackson Family Wines. Um, I'm the Vice President of Sustainability for Jackson Family Wines. I've been with the company for about seven years. And um, we have had a formalized sustainability program that's really been focused on investments in uh, energy efficiency, on-site renewables, and really understanding our impacts since about 2008. And I've really uh, had the good fortune of being able to grow it um, over the last seven or so years. Uh, this slide here is kind of a sneak peek as to where we are headed over the next 10 years, we had just finished up a big uh, resiliency, kind of an internal resiliency planning initiative uh, that encompassed really all aspects and all facets of our business, taking a triple bottom line approach to sustainability and where we want to be 
uh, 10 to 30 years down the road uh, as a family owned and operated company. And some of the key um, facets that we're looking at are around greenhouse gas emissions uh, mitigation. We are aiming to become a quote unquote climate positive company by 2050. And uh, that is really focused on um, you know, understanding our greenhouse gas emissions and uh, reducing and mitigating to a greater extent than what we emit as a company. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of opportunities as we explore that for leveraging our natural and our working lands to sequester carbon dioxide. Um, biochar fits in there, regenerative agriculture and farming really fit in there. So that really informs some of our land use and our farming activities um, to, to, uh, to start that transition for our, uh, all of our internal uh, vineyard acres and also start to have those conversations with our grower partners down the road. Um, and water obviously is a, is a critical component of where we wanna be in the future. And so we've got some, um, some overall reduction goals and some reuse and recycling goals for our winery process water um, and really focusing also on recharge and restoration. Uh, so returning uh, water back into uh, local watersheds and identifying kind of how we can work in concert with nature to repair uh, riparian habitats that we um, influence. Uh, and then finally, on the social impact side, we've all heard so much uh, in the last um, few few months uh, as the world's attention has increasingly been um, turned towards um, uh, racial and uh, racial injustices and equality for um, uh, you know ultimately thinking about what we can do as um, as companies to to further and enhance equality um, across uh, our value chains. So those are some of the things that we are looking at as a as an organization, and um, that has ultimately kind of informed and influenced of international wineries for climate action, which was something that we spun up over the past three years in collaboration with Familia Torres in Spain, which is one of the uh, the leading family owned wine companies in Europe, and we are kind of joined by this um, united by this this joint commitment to. Um, reducing uh, and understanding, uh, first understanding and, and ultimately reducing our greenhouse gas emissions impact. So over the course of the last two years, we've really worked with the Torres family to develop what has now uh, formally become IWCA and that was launched uh, just over a year ago. Uh, we launched just prior to the Porto um, conference, the Porto Protocol Conference um, in February of 2019. And really what we're doing is we're trying, taking a science-based approach to um, measuring and standardizing how we calculate our greenhouse gas emissions within the industry. Um, and then from there, understanding where the hotspots are uh, and taking proactive steps to, uh, to mitigating our greenhouse gas emissions footprint. So really kind of looking at all the things that we need to do to achieve these uh, aggressive um, uh, climate neutrality goals uh, in the near future, in alignment with what uh, what the IPCC uh, scientists say is necessary to uh, avoid the worst impacts of global warming over the next uh, few decades. And uh, in launching in 2019, uh, we were fortunate enough to be joined by uh, six additional uh, forward-thinking wine companies from across the globe. Uh, Symington Family Estates in Portugal, Yelands in uh, New Zealand, Spotswood, and you'll be hearing from Beth uh, in the Napa Valley, Alma Caravejas, which is a, a, a great uh, forward-thinking wine company in the Ribera del Duero region of Spain, VSPT in Chile, and Silver Oak out uh, here in Sonoma and Napa. So we're thrilled to have these additional uh, wineries join on in our, um, in our attempt to um, to uh, make climate change mitigation a, uh, a real force uh, within the wine industry. Um, a little bit about the membership requirements for IWCA for anybody who's interested uh, in joining this organization is open to any wine company uh, anywhere in the world who's willing to um, stand up and meet these membership requirements that we've outlined. So there's a, an on-site renewable energy um, component um, for a membership requirement. Um, and then as you kind of dig deeper, it's, it's really focusing on measuring greenhouse gas emissions using the, the WRI, the World Resources Institute's uh, greenhouse gas protocol and following an ISO process. So really taking that standardized approach to how we measure our greenhouse gas emissions 
because the old adage says you can't manage what you don't measure. And then from there, um, committing to uh, demonstrating that you're already taking proactive efforts to reduce your emissions, 25% um, per unit of wine produced over a baseline emissions inventory year, which for every winery, depending on uh, where they are in the process will be different. Um, and then ultimately signing on to the mid and the long term object objectives of IWCA to uh, reduce total emissions 50% by 2030 and 80% by 2045. And we're actually updating that 80% commitment. Uh, we're in the process of updating that uh, in kind of response to the latest science that's showing um, we need to actually be targeting climate positive or climate neutral uh, by 2050. So those are kind of where we're thinking from high level targets. Um, and in Korea, the key kind of formative documents that we've developed, and I know Caitlin is going to be circulating some of these uh, these materials for everybody to be able to uh, to take a look at, is um, this greenhouse gas emissions inventory guidance worksheet. And this really informs how we calculate greenhouse gas emissions across um, our value chain. And it looks not just at our uh, at our direct greenhouse gas emissions but it also looks at our indirect or our supply chain greenhouse gas emissions. So it's really important to understand that it's not just what you, you produce from an emission standpoint within your four walls, but it's also extends to the supply chain and all of the activities that you essentially create demand for that create emissions like transportation and distribution and things like that. Um, and so, you know, one of the great things that we see can't manage what you don't measure um, standpoint is when wine companies come together with a standardized uh, emissions calculations protocol, you can do things like this. And uh, what this slide here represents is kind of the average uh, winery emissions from all of the eight um, current IWCA members. Um, and ultimately, what you can see here is we've broken it out by scopes. So the green and the blue are, are the direct emissions for a winery. So the scopes one and two emissions. And those include things, kind of the hot spots there are electricity usage in blue. And then in green, it's, it's things like on-site fuel usage for our, uh, our various different um, stationary and mobile equipment. Uh, and kind of one of the big ones that we saw that was really surprising as a large emissions hotspot was emissions from fertilizer application. Um, and so again, that's where you can start to look into some of these things as we start to look at uh, regenerative farming. Um, but then you see the big piece of the pie here representing almost 80% of the entire greenhouse gas footprint is scope three. And those are our, um, our supply chain emissions. So in there are things like wine bottles, packaging, purchase grapes or purchase wine, purchase barrels, transportation emissions from uh, transportation distribution and shipping case goods all over the country, all over the world, and business travel, uh, employee commute. So really understanding that the scope of a company's emissions footprint is not just the things that they directly control, but it's, it's encompassing of all of these activities. And once you have this donut chart, as it were, then you can really start to target your emissions um, mitigation activities. Um, so for us, understanding this uh, really helped us see that, you know, where we needed to target our efforts. And so if you look at things like the, the weight of our glass bottles, right, that's something that um, has long just been assumed that you know, the heavier the glass bottle, the better the wine. And that's just the way that we should look at it. When you actually have data that shows uh, what a large contributor uh, to your greenhouse, overall company wide greenhouse gas emissions footprint that is, it allows you to start asking informed questions and making informed decisions. And one of the actions that we at Jackson Family Wines took over the last um, three to five years is we've shaved a few ounces off of um, some of our, our marquee um, bottle molds, including Kendall Jackson, Vintners Reserve Chardonnay, and the La Crema um, Sonoma Coast wines. And by shaving even two ounces off of each of those bottle molds, um, we've been able to see a pretty significant overall greenhouse gas emissions reduction as a result. But we've also seen some pretty significant cost savings around the order of magnitude of about a million dollars a year as a result of saving and reducing um, just the, the weight of our glass bottles. 
it's a good start. Um, I admit that uh, there is much further that needs to go. But when you see this donut chart, you can really start to get an understanding of where to target and prioritize your activities. YWCA, as we think about 2020 and beyond and where we want to go and where we want to focus our activities as a working group, uh, we've kind of aligned on these top three uh, areas. So first and foremost is around, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions inventories and ensuring that, um, you know, we're continuing to evaluate uh, those emissions hotspots and um, align on best practices for mitigating and addressing them. Um, but also developing a, a streamlined greenhouse gas emissions calculator and verification uh, methodology. And that's something that we've seen in conversations. We've now had conversations with about 50 um, wine companies from all across the world. And we've seen, uh, particularly with a lot of the smaller uh, wine companies, that, that um, you know their primary concern is that a greenhouse gas emissions audit is expensive. It has to be done every year. It has to be done in accordance with these ISO uh, certification standards. And it has to be independently third party verified. We recognize that that's a lot to ask. Um, and so what we are trying to do is we're trying to work through a way in which we can standardize and streamline that process and go to hopefully an online um, uh, kind of uh, way of, of helping some of our smaller um, wine companies particularly be able to do that in a cost effective way. Um, and then really kind of get and telling the story about IWCA, why it matters and, um, and really engaging with trade, media, and consumers. Um, and one of those ways is actually through the development of a, of a product seal that the Torres family is starting to, uh, to trial on some of their wines um, uh, in Europe. And thirdly, uh, developing and establishing these external partnerships. Um, so uh, we're, we're gonna be spinning up a science panel and it's exploring other strategic partnerships to ensure that we are kind of at the forefront of the research that is happening and engaging um, uh, with, uh, with strategic partners all over the world to ensure that uh, we're talking about the most relevant and important things. Um, and one of those, which uh, has been touched on a few times uh, earlier today, is this concept of nature-based climate solutions. And that's when we kind of get going beyond the mitigation to looking at things like uh, sequestration and the activities that we can actually do within our vineyards uh, and within the natural lands that surround our vineyards to uh, create conditions that actually uh, enhance soil carbon sequestration um, and can actually sequester atmospheric carbon dioxide. We've done some initial research um, and we're actually just going to be engaging at a deeper level with the Soil Health Institute um, to really explore um, the most appropriate and effective ways of sequestering carbon in our natural and our working lands. Uh, at a regional level, uh, because we farm in different geographic regions throughout uh, the state of California as well as Oregon. So really taking a targeted approach to understanding which soil types and what types of um, regenerative farming um, activities that we can uh, employ will build soil health in the most meaningful and lasting way and help us sequester more carbon uh, in our soils. And those are things that we want to open source and share as we are learning through the IWCA platform. But as you can see from this chart here on the right, this is a high level um, kind of look for Jackson family wines at our overall greenhouse gas emissions footprint. And as we are targeting climate positive, there are, you know, there's a certain level at which, you know, we can only mitigate so much and that sequestration as an agriculture and land based company. Um, there's really a tremendous opportunity for all of us in the wine grape industry to take part in, um, in these activities to help sequester um, carbon in their soils. And increasingly, there are um, a, a lot more sophisticated uh, markets that are starting to develop. Um, and I see a lot of movement and opportunity within the next five to 10 years in particular to where um, farmers can actually hopefully start to get paid um, through market mechanisms to create those conditions that sequester carbon in our soils. And if we can align those, those market forces with the right farming practices that align with quality um, and yield and all the other things that we're looking to target as farmers, um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for agriculture in general and a huge opportunity for the wine industry to lead that transformation. 
And so with that, um, I am going to introduce um, Beth Novak Milliken, who's the president and CEO of Spotswood Estate. And I have a few preloaded questions for you, Beth. So I'm going to stop sharing so we can um, focus on seeing your lovely face and not looking at <laughs> presentation. Um, and we can dive into some Q&A if that works for you. So, sounds good. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just great. Perfect. Um, so from a high level, uh, what were what were the driving forces behind your interest in um, in joining IWCA? So for us, I mean, we've been we've been farming organically since 1985. That was really the start of our of our move into sort of environmental awareness. Um, we were the first to start doing that, and that was thanks to Tony Soder and his vision around that. And ever since that time, you know, and and more so probably starting in the like around 2000 when we when we spearheaded the restoration of Spring Creek, which borders the southern boundary of our vineyard. And then in 07, we joined 1% for the planet and we we brought in solar and we've we've just sort of really upped our game around our environmental initiatives and just doing everything we can just because it was the right thing to do. And then ultimately a man named Martin Reyes went to the Porto Protocol for us just to get a, a sense of it to see what was happening there. And he came back with great excitement about um, IWCA and said, this is something that, you know, we should be looking into. And so based upon that, we looked into it and it just, it fits right in with our whole ethos around uh, doing everything we can to be good stewards of our environment, which is, as we know, very imperiled. Um, so, uh, you know, I touched on the, um, the membership requirements um, mm -hmm. earlier on in my presentation and, um, you know, it's, it was a laundry list of things that we're requiring of our members. And I think that there are some, uh, you know, in the conversations we've had with 50 other wineries over the last year and a half, um, uh, I think some are probably maybe more daunting than others. Um, was there any, any thoughts that you had as to kind of um, our membership requirements and what that process was like for you? Right. I mean, I think the main one you've already touched on, which was getting the GHGs measured. I mean, for us, it was to get our 2018 GHG emissions measured was $14,000. Getting our 2019 updating is $11,200. So for a winery hour size, that's not an insignificant undertaking, aside from which, of course, it's all of the data gathering, uh, which we're working hard to come up with a system for ourselves where we can along the way, plug in knowing what we need to come up with every year. For example, business travel, which for 2020 will be really quite easy because there isn't <laughs> any. Um, uh, but, but that sort of thing where we can come up with a system whereby we can gather that information more easily. Um, that was certainly one of them. And then one that's a head scratcher for us is how we as a small winery. So by the time we got into this and we measured our 2018 emissions, we have already just on our own, again, always looking toward being more energy efficient. We have replaced a lot of equipment. We had purchased um, optical sorter and, and equipment that we can wash more easily using less water, steam barrel cleaners. A lot of this we've already done. And so when we had our 18 emissions measured, then we're looking at, well, then how realistically can we drop it by 25%? And that's why with you, I brought up the question, well, what can we do? With our estate vineyarders, are there some offsets there? Or what do we do? Because how are we want to do better, but we're already emitting quite little. And yep. so how do we how do we drop off of that 18? And so there's going to have to be, which you know, which you and I have talked about how how we're gonna do that. And we're studying it, but it's gonna be a little tougher. We can't just go to lighter glass as an example, right off the bat, unless and my hope for IWCA is that it arrives at a glass is sanctioned and viewed as a great environmental glass and and speaks to quality also so there's a lot of different things but it's a great to me have measured this by the way with the ghg emissions to have actually measured that and to know where we are is really really important yeah yeah so digging deeper into your greenhouse gas emissions inventory um were there any any results from that initial inventory uh, that surprised you when you saw that the pie in its entirety yeah i would say so uh, Spotswoods, we sell a fair bit of our wine direct to consumer. I think seeing the actual cost, environmental cost of shipping individual cases of wine to to consumers around the country, uh, that was certainly a large a large part of our emissions. Of course, that's the weight of glass and it's a lot of air freight because wine has to be shipped 
temperature controlled as we know, and so you can't ship it in you know slower manners. Um, and so I think that was probably a big one. Also, just some of the commuting, and then of course some of the travel emissions. And I think again, getting back to what I sort of joked about with 2020, but my hope is that with the fact that we haven't been able to travel for business, my hope is that when whatever does happen with this, if we find a vaccination, if we're all of that. I hope that we really all rethink how we do operate in terms of our travel and don't just think that jumping on a plane um, and, and getting somewhere at the drop of a hat is, is what we need to do anymore to, to sell our wines that we can find a better hybrid where we can do some virtually and we can do some, we still need to see people, we are social animals, but doing it with a, a more thoughtful approach. So I think those were the interesting things was business travel, a little bit of commuting, and then definitely the shipping of our wines to our consumers. Excellent. Um, so, with regard to your participation in IWCA so far, and we had our, our inaugural uh, member kickoff meeting last month, um, what are some of the benefits that you've seen and anything that you've learned kind of so far uh, in from some of the other member wineries? So, I, I really enjoyed that that kickoff meeting. It was great to meet everybody um, on that and to talk about, I mean, I think for me, that what I really am going to derive a lot of enjoyment from, and I think benefit is just being able to share ideas and best practices and just sort of that collaborative effort toward what we can all do better. And like you, you touched on this, Julian, but I really have this strong notion that the wine industry, we are deeply impacted by climate change, right? I mean, we are an agricultural business and we really, I'd love to see us as an industry lead in so many ways. I mean, my my hero is Yvonne Chouinard in Patagonia. I love that company. I love every all of their messaging, everything that they do, their catalogs and how they how they bring about change and try to affect positive change through what they do. And to me, obviously we can do what we do on our own and share that information with our customers. But if we can have a broader platform, which is what IWCA offers, I think that it's a just so much stronger a voice, and I really love to see our industry take a really strong lead on on climate change. I couldn't agree more. Um, so, Spotswood is a small winery in the grand yeah. scheme of things. Um, right. You know, and you're you're sitting you're sitting in the room with, uh, you know, some of the some larger wineries like Jackson Family Wines and Toros and Symington. Um, what do you see as as some of the ways that that you can kind of influence the climate agenda for the global wine industry as a small laser focused um, wine company? Uh, good question. Uh, my, my hope is to bring more in about the, the growing and you touched on that, but just the regenerative aspects and what we all can do, because while it is important to have, for example, lighter glass or to do those types of things, and you touched on this just in your last presentation, I think we can do a lot on the farming side and, and I'd like to see that. Uh, because I think that's a really important uh, piece of what we do um, and hopefully even take stronger environmental stances. I mean, I look at and I, this one will be controversial, but, you know, the best way for us to keep uh, carbon and to pull it out is to retain our, our forested lands. I'd like to be able to speak to things like don't not not about reforestation, which is important and we need to talk about it and we need to do it. But proforestation, let's really talk about not taking out forest land to plant vineyards as an example how do we how do we protect our our existing um you know protect biodiversity and protect what's in the ground so i hopefully we'll be able to to take some some bold stances that that will be controversial but for us to get anywhere we're going to have to be willing to sort of at least discuss and and have good dis, you know this discourse around around some more controversial topics well, I look forward to those topics, and um, I think that you know, as we grow and as uh, IWCA continues to to grow and and learn, um, you know, it's 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 very exciting to see some incredibly committed wineries come together and have these meaningful um, data driven discussions and conversations. So, um, I agree. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to to join us on this um, on this really exciting. And I think for all of those of you still on, um, thank you for for sticking with this. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, IWCA is open to any and all members, um, and we are would love to uh, engage and, and, and uh, kind of share more about the process for joining 
Um, Caitlin is going to be sending out uh, some additional materials about uh, how to join IWCA and circulating that uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, inventory uh, guidance document. So you can all see kind of how we're tracking and, and what it looks like. So uh, it's it's been a pleasure. And again, Beth, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And, um, I'll answer any questions if anybody has any at this point. Yeah, th thank you for having me and yeah, and thanks. Thanks for giving for creating this organization that gives all of us a chance to participate in this in a bigger way. It's great. Thank you so much, Beth and uh, Julian. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing that and for talking to us uh, about your organization. Um, it's it's a real honor to have uh, to have uh, Beth here. I don't see any. Um... Oh, here's one. Uh... The 20% on-site renewable could be difficult for smaller wineries that may not have the appropriate surfaces or orientations to meet this. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, you know, you, you got to do the analysis and figure out where, what, what it, you know, where the, the opportunities lie for energy, uh, for on-site systems. It's really, it's a case by case. Um, it happens on a case by case basis. I can just tell you from our experience at Jackson Family Wines, um, you know, we've installed renewable energy systems um, on 12 of our winemaking facilities in California and Oregon, um, most of which have been roof mounted. Um, a couple, we have a couple ground mounted systems. And we're actually looking at a pond mounted system. There's a company out there called Ciela Terre that uh, has now had a significant amount of success in uh, installing uh, solar arrays that actually can uh, can go on your um, uh, your uh, irrigation ponds. So um, and those kind of serve multiple benefits. Actually, if you put you know, panels on a portion of the pond, it helps reduce evaporation. It can help with algae issues. And it also, by virtue of the panels being floated on the top of a pond, it keeps them cooler. And contrary to popular belief, uh, solar panels actually need to be cool. They need sun, but they want to be cool because it increases their efficiency. So there's many ways to skin the cat, um, as I see it. But we're also, um, you know, specific to that renewable energy requirement. Uh, we do have some kind of workarounds uh, acknowledging that some regions are further ahead than others on which kind of how much of a percentage of renewables exists on the grid. So, you know, here in Sonoma County, Napa County, increasingly throughout California, we have these community choice aggregation programs where you can actually uh, opt in to sourcing 100% um, renewable energy. And if you do that, then that uh, that requirement is waived. 